Good evening. Uh, I'm Mike Knatter. Welcome to the UW Now live stream series where we showcase experts from the UW community talking about issues related to the COVID-19 crisis. Last week, we had Thomas Friedrich, Professor of Pathobiological Sciences from the School of Veterinary Medicine, talking about the virus spread in Wisconsin and the sequencing of the virus. This week, we'll have two interesting guests talking about the impact of COVID-19 on frontline healthcare workers, and in particular nurses, and also on the efforts to bring in the Badger freshman class of 2019 uh, and our financial aid programs. Today also marks Giving Tuesday Now, and UW-Madison is participating in this. Uh, if you're able to, please support UW through one of our priority areas, including the UW Health COVID-19 Response Fund, UW Health COVID-19 Research Fund, the Emergency Student Support Fund, and the Chancellor's Annual Fund, which supports greatest needs outside of those three areas, including some of our educational innovations. Tonight, we'll discuss the impact of COVID-19 on both the field of nursing and on the adjustments to attracting that Badger freshman class. Our first guest is Barb Panekenstein, and she is the Richard Seneco Professor in Healthcare Leadership at the UW-Madison School of Nursing. She'll be followed by Derek Kindle, who is the Vice Provost for Enrollment Management and the Acting Director of Student Financial Aid. Barb has over 20 years of leadership experience as Chief Nursing, nursing Officer and VP of Informatics, and she's studied nursing workforce, innovation, mentoring, and also nursing fatigue. Barb, it's great to have you with us tonight. Why don't you tell us a little bit about what's happening in the field of nursing at this moment in the COVID crisis and some of the longer term challenges that you see and how we're addressing them at UW-Madison. Thanks, Mike, for that introduction. And I'm really thrilled to be here to represent nursing. So um, nursing is working very hard on the front lines, delivering care across the continuum. So we're working in the hospital settings, in nursing homes, we're at the front lines in public health. Um, as ambulatory care has gone virtual, we're working virtually in ambulatory care and to try to deliver and are indeed delivering exceptional care to the patients that we're serving. So it's tough right now because nurses are working very long hours. They're working in full protective gear, which we'll talk about in a couple minutes. And um, we're working as a critical member of the team, meeting the patient's emotional and physical needs. So it's requiring us to monitor the patient, respond to quickly changing patient conditions, and meeting the human touch needs of, of the patients that we serve. Because as people know, family members can't be present right now during a pandemic. So if you go to my next slide, um, and as they're pulling that up, I had a beautiful quote from an experienced nurse that said, although I, I can't see the light at the end of the tunnel yet, I am the light for my patients. So I wanted to just briefly share the current data as of today in Wisconsin about the number of cases and the number of hospitalized patients in the state. So you can see there that the, the number of positive cases is up to over 8,500 um, 8, patients. And I think it's important to note that at least 15% of the positive cases are healthcare workers. And we've had fairly significant numbers of hospitalizations and the highest counties in the state that have been impacted have been Milwaukee, Brown, Waukesha and Dane. It's good to know that our testing capacity has increased. And it's also important to note that as we look at the number of positive cases, about 19% of those patients don't exhibit any symptoms. So, but yet they're infectious. So next slide. So it's really important that we take precautions. So this slide, and this is off of the Wisconsin Department of Health website, 
which is an excellent website. And I really encourage our listeners to go there. Um, there's phenomenal resources there. It shows that right now we're really having a lot of trouble in the state with facility outbreaks. And the nursing homes and group home facilities have been impacted the most with outbreaks. And, and you can see it, we really have a significant number there of over 90 um, long-term care facilities that have been impacted. And those facilities um, have the most challenges in accessing personal protective equipment. And they often um, have the slimmest staffing levels um, in, in caring for patients in comparison to the way that we staff, for instance, in a hospital setting. So next slide. So I think people are aware, but these are the major risk factors for, for COVID. And so if people are over 65, if you're living in a nursing home, if you're chronically ill, or if you're immune compromised, you really need to take extra precautions. Next slide. And it's important for all of us in order to prevent infections in our loved ones and our communities to take positive actions to flatten the curve. So I wanted to remind people of the importance of hand washing, social distancing, safe at home, and really following the guidelines that are out there as those guidelines might change in the future. So next slide. So the hospital response, we're very lucky in Wisconsin that, that we have wonderful nursing staff and we have exceptional hospitals and healthcare systems. And in Wisconsin, when you look at our data and our number of beds, we've been very lucky that we have had enough beds for patients to be admitted to the hospital. We've had enough critical care beds and we've had access to ventilators. And that's very different than what's happening in some of the other states looking at New York as an example. But one of the things that the hospital did um, early in the pandemic was they discharged all the patients that were well enough to go home and they canceled elective surgeries. And so what has happened in our hospital settings, since we haven't been um, doing elective surgeries, is you'll have some nursing units that may have low census or nurses will be working in other units that they're not typically on. And they're also working very long hours and caring for very ill patients. Next slide. So as we look at the critical role of, of nursing to deliver patient-focused, exceptional care that meets both the physical and emotional needs of patients, it takes outstanding critical thinking and decision-making skills. Our nurses have to be technologically savvy. We deal with a lot of high-tech equipment. Um, we, we work as a member of an interdisciplinary team, and we are the ones that are at the bedside 24 hours a day caring for patients that are critically ill. And the challenges of doing that pre-pandemic, you might be on a medical surgical nursing unit and you might have from maybe one to three patients that are in isolation where you take off your protective equipment and maybe you're in a room in, in that e using that equipment for maybe 15 or 20 minutes. Today with COVID, nurses are wearing their personal protective equipment the entire time that they're in the healthcare setting. And, and that consists of a gown, a face mask, goggles, or a face shield, gloves. And the challenges the, that nursing staff are having is that they're getting headaches from sometimes breathing in that carbon monoxide. Um, they're getting pressure sores from sometimes the masks and the way that it sits. They're having challenges with neck pain. And, and it's very fatiguing being in that full equipment for 12 hours a day. So nurse fatigue during a pandemic is a critically important issue. Um, prior to the pandemic, about 65% of the nurses were fatigued and they had um, either acute fatigue or chronic fatigue. 
And so if you go to the next slide, it's really important for nursing staff to have time off to be able to recover between shifts, that they need breaks, they need adequate sleep and rest. And um, it's not something that they can just individually do. Um, healthcare systems are working on implementing and need to implement more fatigue risk management systems to have a systematic approach to trying to mitigate fatigue. So the long 12 hour shifts, wearing all the equipment is their challenge right now. And so healthcare systems are trying to look at how they're staffing and scheduling nurses to deal with that issue. So next slide. So in Wisconsin, we have about 90,000 nurses that are registered in the state. And again, I shared that they're working on the front lines across all the settings. Over 50% of our nursing workforce works in the hospital, but only 4% works in public health and community health. And the average age of a nurse is, is 46. And we have some critical issues, if you go to the next slide, in um, different specialty areas. But I think even prior to the pandemic, 43% of the nurse, this is based on 2018 data, said that they were going to work less than the next 10 years. And we still have a number of baby boomers that are still working in nursing. So we have an impending nursing shortage that's going to get worse with significant numbers of retirements. And we have shortages right now in areas like um, not enough critical care nurses, not enough infection control nurses, needing more nurses that can go into population health or public health. And so the need for the nursing school to make sure that we're um, training the next generation of nurses and for healthcare systems to try to work at keeping nurses longer into the profession is really important to mitigate the issue. So I'm thrilled to be working at the School of Nursing, um, developing the next generation of nurses, and with a focus on developing leaders in research, education, and practice. And right now we have over a thousand student nurses um, we're one of the most technologically advanced schools of nursing in the nation. We have an incredible faculty team. And I'm pleased to say that even with the pandemic, we're going to be graduating about 240 nurses at the end of this week. So right now to get your baccalaureate degree in nursing, there are three pathways to do that. You can come in the traditional way where your last two years at college junior and senior are within the nursing school. Um, we have launched a new program called an accelerated program where we admit second degree students. So their their degrees in another field and they come in and within 12 months they graduate with a baccalaureate in nursing. And then we also have um, a program that's an RN to BSN where they can get their baccalaureate degree at home. We do that in collaboration with some of the other UW schools. We have two doctoral programs, a doctorate in nursing practice, where we're training nurse practitioners, clinical nurse specialists. And we also have a doctor of philosophy, which is the research philosophy and certificate programs. An example there is training nurses in um, mental health certification. And I'm pleased to share that we're soon going to be launching, we're in the final stages of approval for two new DNP tracks that will be a system leadership and innovation track and a DNP in population health, which I think given the pandemic is um, just coming out at the best time because we know we need more nurses that can lead and innovate and transform care and the delivery of care and that can deal with the significant challenges that we have to do population health. So next slide, please. So it's wonderful that this is um, National Nurses Week starts tomorrow. Um, the last day of National Nurses Week is Florence Nightingale's 200th birthday. 
And it's also the International Year of the Nurse and the Midwife. So it's a wonderful time to recognize nursing at this time, and next slide, and to um, take time during this week. I'll do a call to action because nurses at the bedside are working so hard right now. And um, they, they truly are not only caring for patients, but in, in many cases, they're, um, you know, they're at risk for COVID. And so they're trying to do all the right things to keep their patients safe and keep their families safe. So please take time to recognize and support nurses. Think about supporting the nursing school and consider a gift of scholarship because we know that one of the most challenging things for students today is the cost of tuition and supplies. So thank you. Barb, thank you very much for those remarks. Um, we've got some audience questions rolling in, but as is our practice, I'm gonna start and ask you a question because something in your presentation really jumped off the page to me and that was 15% of the positive COVID tests in, in the state are healthcare workers. And you know, what's really amazing about that, you know, I doubt that the healthcare workers are necessarily picking it up in the community because chances are they're among the most careful when they're out in the community, I would imagine, um, and have been from the beginning. So that must mean that the odds of getting exposed in the, in the setting in which you're caring for patients are just really quite high to have that high a percentage with the healthcare workers. So the first thing I'd say, Mike, is we're hoping that trend's going to come down over time because as we learn more about COVID and how COVID is spread, there have been um, lots, of, lots of improved processes within healthcare settings, right? So um, as an example, um, most nursing staff today, if you're working in the hospital when it's the end of your shift, if you can, you're gonna change your clothes and take a shower um, before you actually leave the hospital setting. Or if you can't do that, you're going home. Many people are um, changing their clothes, believe it or not, in their garages. They're not taking their shoes in their house because we found out that you can track the virus across settings on your shoes. Um, washing your clothes, I think, we have all done more educational sessions to reinforce the importance of how you take off those gowns and gloves. Many settings have people, um, even when you put on your protective equipment, they check you before you go into a COVID room to make sure that everything's on correctly. Um, but it, it is important um, that we all take precautions because this is a very infectious virus. And, um, and so I, I know people who aren't going home, they're staying in hotels if they feel they're at risk in order to protect their families. And so um, it's, it's a stressful time because you wanna protect the patients, you wanna provide the best care that you can you want to protect yourself, but you really want to protect your family also. Yeah. I mean, I guess if we've learned anything about this, it's that this virus is a moving target and we're constantly learning and updating. And, you know, it, it it's a great point you make. Hopefully we can continue to learn and make progress and protect our healthcare workers better uh, through better knowledge. Uh, I have a question, audience question from Scott, who wonders, how do you think the pandemic will in the long term affect the supply of nursing, the demand for nursing, and nursing education, uh, all those things? A great question. So um, I think we have, um, well, right, this pandemic is a marathon. It's not a sprint. And, and I think based on what we know today, it's, it's not going away quickly unless we have vaccines and treatment. And so um, that coupled with um, and this is kind of my worldview, a lot of people have been avoiding going into the hospital right now. All these elective surgeries that should have been occurring have been delayed. So I think once the hospitals open up, 
we're going to be very busy and there's going to be an increased demand for nursing. Um, my concern is, I think when you look at what happens after major disasters, um, you do see a, a lot of the responders um, have increased health issues and often go into retirement at higher levels than prior to the disaster. So I, I am predicting, given the number of older nurses that we still have um, in the profession, that um, when this is over, we're going to see an increased number of retirements. And we will continue to need more nurses because we're caring for sicker patients that are older, that have uh, much more complicated situations. I would tell you that um, I participated in our application interviews for the fall um, nursing class and our um, acceptance letters are, I think are going out at the um, end of this week. And I was so inspired by the stellar candidates that we have that want to become our future nurses. Many of them are, were working already in nursing homes as nursing assistants and um, still want to be nurses, even though there's a pandemic going on. They are committed to making a difference in providing quality care for patients and their families. And I, I need to tell you, I was just inspired by the interviews. They they are just going to be an incredible class. Um, I love teaching at UW because we have the most exceptional students. So I, the need will be great. Um, the nursing schools are not graduating. If, if you look at, um, we've done some modeling in Wisconsin about our future nursing workforce needs. And if you add up all the total graduating nursing students across all the nursing schools in Wisconsin, we have a gap with our future workforce needs. And that gap is projected to be a very significant gap. So we need, I believe, to increase the number of students that we're graduating. And we've been very creative in um, during virtual online classes and simulations. Um, but the pandemic, I think, will have changed us forever. Um, probably in some good ways because we've we've been very innovative and the faculty has really stepped up in our ability to teach during the pandemic and and students have just done an exceptional job well that's great to hear you know as, as you were answering that question i was going to ask you are there special challenges unique to nursing education that arise when we have to do things remotely or are you able to yeah so absolutely so um we have provided more online virtual experiences uh, we have a simulation lab but at the moment we're not able to be in the clinical settings in the simulation labs we're really hoping that we'll be um be in the clinical settings in the fall but we don't yet know that um, but so um we've done some very creative and innovative best practice um, responses to that challenge. And because we're such a technologically advanced school, we were able to do that. I think we also were ahead of the game in that we had front loaded a lot of our clinical hours. But as an example for this summer, we actually had to change the courses we're teaching in the summer to make wow. it work. Yeah. Okay. Well, kudos to you and the team. It's been a um, great team. Judith wonders who takes care of nurses' emotional needs. That's a really great question. Um, and you know, nurses are servant leaders. And in my mind, they are heroes in the field because they're always caring for others first. And sometimes they're putting their personal needs second. And so I've actually done a lot of work with nurses um, talking about if you don't care for self, you can't care for other people. And so each of us personally needs to um, recognize when we're hitting that wall and we need to take personal steps um, to make sure we're taking care of ourself. 
And I would say the importance of family, friends, working for an organization that recognizes staff needs time off and they need time to recover. Um, so we all, I think, have a role to play in recognizing and um, giving people permission to take care of self so that you can give the quality care that you want to give. Great answer. Um, Matt has a two part question and one, the first part is uh, for healthcare workers today, do all of them get tested or only workers that are exhibiting symptoms? And then what are the criteria for when nurses or other healthcare workers should not work? That's a great question. So, um, and the first thing I'd say is there are different policies and different organizations. Um, the governor announced, I think, yesterday that um, he, he's going to require um, all nursing home patients and, and nursing home staff to be tested. Um, that I don't believe that's happening yet. Um, currently, most healthcare workers are not tested. Um, in many situations, their temperatures are checked. And the CDC just yesterday um, announced new guidelines about if, if a healthcare worker has been sick, what are the circumstances and when can they go back to work? So that's actually on the CDC website, I think, as of yesterday. So um, there's new criteria out there in order to um, keep everybody safe, right? Because one of the things about COVID is um, we found that um, it doesn't just necessarily go away in two weeks. Some, some people have it for longer periods of time. Thank you. Uh, question from Caitlin. She wonders how are local care facilities collaborating in their care for patients? So um, that's a great question. I think for um, those care facilities that are part of healthcare systems, there's a whole structure and a support to work across that healthcare system. And one, one of the things that happens during um, emergency pandemics is the need for constant updated communication is really important. Our main way of collaborating is through that um, state incident command system. So each healthcare system will have an emergency liaison person. And so providing those updates and working in regions like the Dane County hospitals and facilities working, the Milwaukee area working together, and then there's a state structure that coordinates that. And then um, we've always had, Mike, I would say good communication and work about um, transferring patients between facilities. If for when a nursing home patient needs to be transferred to a hospital or somebody needs to be transferred from a community hospital to an academic, you know, higher level care. There have been really stellar communication systems that, that work and triage systems that help us do that. Great. Question from Ron, are we seeing an increase in the number of men who wish to study nursing and what, what do you do to try to attract men to the field um, of nursing? That is a great question, and I'm really pleased to tell you that we have seen an increase in men in nursing. And um, Wisconsin, as a percentage of men in nursing, has been lower than the country as a whole. But our numbers at the School of Nursing have absolutely been going up. Our diversity numbers have also been going up. So that um, right now our, our class has about 20% diversity and I think it's about, if I'm remembering correctly, 16% men in nursing. And um, we're seeing veterans coming back and going into nursing. I, I think we, um, we've established men in nursing um, student groups and there's been both a state and a major national push to get more men in nursing. Ultimately, we'd like to see the number of nurses in the profession match the demographics of the Wisconsin citizens. And we're, we're doing a really good job. One of the things that we've done in, at UW is what's called holistic admissions. So we don't just look at grade points. We, we look at the student overall and all of their experiences. 
and we pick absolutely the students that we feel are going to be the best students, nurses, and leaders for the profession. And again, we're getting stellar candidates. So I'm um, going to ask you one last question. Um, are nursing shortages, do you think, greater in the United States than in other developed countries? What do you know about that, Barb? Uh, the nursing shortage is a global issue. Um, we actually have a number of nurses from other countries that uh, come into the United States. Um, I would tell you in all my years of nursing, um, and it's been a few, I've, I've seen ups and downs with the vacancy rates. Um, prior to the pandemic, we were probably um, looking at hospitals in the state. We were probably somewhere, depending on the healthcare system, at a three to 5% vacancy rate. I have seen some projections that, so I look at it as it's the calm before the storm. Um, given the number of um, needed nurses we'll need in the future and the number of re retiring nurses, and I would say one of our greatest bottlenecks is the number of available faculty. We have less than 900 faculty teaching in the colleges and universities and nursing schools in Wisconsin. And um, the average age of a faculty member is um, more than 50. So we have almost half the number of faculty that are expected to retire in the future. So um, we, it's a scary number. We could be seeing vacancies in the future of 20 and 30%, depending on how far out you go. So we have got to look at strategies to both retain nursing staff in the field, leverage the wisdom of nursing staff, and um, increase the number of students that we're graduating. Barb, thank you for joining us tonight and giving us this, this great window into the field of nursing and how the COVID crisis is, is impacting nursing. Uh, that was really wonderful. And, you know, I just wanna say a special thank you. I'm gonna sleep a little bit better tonight after having seen your presentation, because I noticed you kind of bumped up the risk factor to age 65. You know, a lot of people were talking age 60 and I was a little nervous about that, but I'm gonna sleep better tonight now. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. Well, now um, our next guest is Derek Kindle who is a national expert in higher education, uh, especially in the areas of enrollment management and student financial aid. He spent 20 years of his career in those areas and his focus within that is on expanding access, improving student retention rates and improving graduation rates. Uh, Derek has been a real innovator on the Madison campus since he joined us in the area of student financial aid initially. Um, he uh, developed the Badger Promise uh, in partnership with others, which is a tuition reduction program for first-generation students with need. Derek was also uh, the inspiration behind Bucky's Tuition Promise, which delivers a package of financial support needed to cover four years of tuition and full fees for undergraduate students from Wisconsin whose families are below median income. And 20% of our students, as I understand it, qualify for one of those uh, two programs already which is great to see uh, that kind of support going out. Uh, Derek has also been a fantastic partner for us at the UW Foundation, not only in raising funds for student financial aid, but also for being really effective in the distribution of those funds and developing our stewardship programs for scholarship donors uh, with the students as well. Uh, and that's been a really uh, motivating and inspirational experience for us. And then finally, uh, Derek has also brought a research lab into his office where we're really studying the efficacy of different financial aid programs on student success. And so uh, it's no wonder you are a new vice provost of enrollment management and acting director of student financial aid, your old job. So you can now report to yourself. And, uh, you know, I talk to myself sometimes too, Derek. So, uh, but why don't you take it away and tell us a little bit about What's going on with student financial aid, uh, especially some of the critical needs in the COVID crisis? And then we'll uh, take some questions as well from the audience. So, Derek Kendall. Thanks, Mike. It's great to be a part of 
the, the Wisconsin family. And I think um, uh, special thanks to Barb and to all of our frontline responders who've helped us through this. Um, tonight, we're talking specifically about how to support those who have those emerging needs. And one of the things that we quickly did at UW-Madison was stand up an emergency student support fund uh, in a centralized way. So we were the first of the Big Ten to really get this out to students. And this is as they were returning for spring break. So if you look at some of the things that our students were considering as they were returning from spring break, uh, you have a couple of things there, right? You have food, you have housing, basic needs, uh, academic supports and tutoring, as well as their mental health and health insurance. And these are things that students across the country are considering and things that UW-Madison was especially uh, on to make sure that uh, we're very quick and nimble in our response. So one of the things we did was to quickly stand up a centralized way that students could request support and that support would span the wide range of things. So in collaboration with campus partners, especially um, our great partners uh, in student affairs, we got this uh, set up very quickly. Some of our results are already in. Uh, the, this slide you can see was as of uh, April 27th, but we're nearing 6,000 now emergency student aid requests. And about 30% of those are from our first generation students. So this really demonstrates uh, the great need that our students are facing as they uh, return from spring break and now are uh, at all parts. We have a couple of students who are still on campus who for many reasons couldn't return home. So they are in uh, the dorms. Our uh, director of housing and dining services is really good about making sure that those students that we do have uh, still in our dorms are, are making sure that practicing safe social distancing measures uh, and, and really being healthy as we keep them there. Uh, our students are requesting aid for a number of different reasons. And on the next slide, you can see that. So some things, uh, students who are here, maybe there's a roommate who could move home. The student can't move home immediately, uh, paying for two apartments, maybe one back home if they can't return to the home for a number of reasons. And we'll talk about some of those a little later. And then just general living expenses. So uh, many of our students work at Wisconsin. We have a very, very proud tradition of uh, over 80% of our students working in any given academic year. And those are off-campus and on-campus jobs. And many of our students having more than one job. I know those of you in our Badger family know what that experience is like uh, to perhaps work in the union and then have another job on the weekend or at other free time uh, as you can find the time to do so. We have students with immediate travel needs, whether they needed to return home or to other places, those who are taking care of family members, including siblings, medical expenses and food insecurity. And so you can see the many different reasons why uh, our students need our support. If we look at some of the reactions that we have and some of the responses from our students, you can see on this slide, it's just a, a, an example of the broad range of experiences. So this particular student who requested funding had a sick, a sick father who's over the 60 years, Mike, uh, but has pre-existing health conditions uh, including some things that would prevent the student from being able to return home and feeling that the student is putting their, their father at risk. And so that student, of course, uh, had to continue to pay to live in, in, in Madison and not be able to return home, which meant uh, other uh, financial needs that the student has. Another is a student who's a graduate student. And so one of our graduate students here is a high-risk high risk pregnancy, couldn't return uh, to work, even though the work was offered because of the high-risk pregnancy and the difficulties with potentially exposing herself and her uh, unborn child to coronavirus. And so it was really difficult for her to continue to pay bills without the support from our emergency student support fund. And last but not least, on one of the examples you can see here that it was uh, difficult for one of our students to, and many of our students, but to return home, uh, our students from our international students don't necessarily have the ability to quickly pick up and to return uh, to their home country uh, during the coronavirus. So this was some of the, these are some of the concerns that our students have during this time. Uh, this student was stuck here for the foreseeable future. This might even be into the summer. And some of these things are unplanned in terms of their financial outlook and including the un inability to work. And that's especially important for our international students who uh, by virtue of the visa status they have are not able to work um, just anywhere. They really have to maintain some on-campus employment. Our students are incredibly grateful. They're always grateful for the support we have. And there are some comments from some of our students who've received funds. 
this student in particular says uh, this lifts a lot off their back. They no longer have to worry about finding work, which would have been incredibly difficult right now uh, to finish the year off strong academically, which is exactly what we want our Badgers to do. Another student expresses how grateful they are in the next slide about uh, you literally solved all of my worries in less than a day. And so we're really honing in on our response time. Our triage team and the Office of Student Financial Aid has responded in less than a day to our requests um, that are made during the week. And you can see how grateful our students are to quickly get that support to them uh, and, and from all of the support that we can provide to students. And that's not only the financial support, but those are from our campus partners who are providing academic support, tutoring, laptops from our library services and our information technology teams. And so our students are really receiving um, arms wrapped, wrapped wide around them to help them out during COVID-19. In the next slide, you can see some of the other thank yous. Uh, this, I think all of you know from your own UW experience or for those you know with the UW experience is really, really impactful for our alum, for our future Badger, uh, Badger alums. And so this talking about their family's small fi uh, family business and um, its impact with the economic crisis that COVID-19 has created for many and their family health issues. And so the support that those of you who are watching and those that you know have provided to our students is incredibly important. When we look at our continued support of students, we're really looking at it in a number, of, a number of different facets. And so on the next slide, you can see here Bucky's tuition promise, which Mike mentioned a, a bit earlier. And this again is our promise, our commitment to Wisconsin residents that if they are at or below the state median income, which we've rounded up to about $60,000, will provide the support for them to round out their tuition and fees for four years. Uh, this is a, a brainchild, not just of our Office of Student Financial Aid, but of Professor Nick Hillman and our STAR Lab, our Student Success of Applied Research Lab. I'm really proud of what Bucky's tuition promise not only means for UW-Madison, but most importantly, what it means to our Wisconsin families. In our next slide, you'll see a little bit here about the types of services that our students are receiving. It's the success coaching, mentorship, basic needs support and a workshop series. These are the services that they've received uh, from our campus in a number of different ways, historically in person for the most part, and now that we've moved to a virtual environment. So these are one-on-one -on -one, uh, video chats with folks who can help them navigate these uh, needs, workshops that we've now recorded and placed online, and mentorship still goes on and now working and moving that into a virtual environment. I uh, can't say enough about how grateful we are for Professor Nick Hillman and the rest of our Student Success Applied, applied Research Lab. It's the first of its kind in, our, in the country. And really, we are connecting the research angle with financial aid, not just for UW-Madison, but as something that would help, in the spirit of the Wisconsin idea, other campuses. One great example of Nick's work and the work of his team uh, really is a graduate student, Jared Colston, who's done the next slide. And this is from the CARES Act. So the president signed into law the CARES Act, which provided support to many different types of institutions, not least of which are our um, colleges and universities across the country. And so the CARES Act provided uh, the inst funding for institutions to provide emergency assistance to students and assistance to the institution as a whole. And so what the STAR Lab did was put together this incredible map. Uh, this is an interactive map uh, with lots of dots. Those dots represent institutions. And institutions and others and policymakers can go through, click on one of those that represents an institution and get a lot of data, not only about the allocation they received, but also about um, some other data points that are necessary in order to determine how to best distribute aid. So for example, the average debt of the students that they, that they have on their campus. If we go to the next slide, some of the takeaways that we're learning here uh, apply to not only our continuing students, but to the future Badgers we'll have. And so if we think about some of those considerations, uh, students and families are concerned about whether instruction will be in person or whether it be virtual or whether it'll be some type of hybrid, uh, whether this fall semester will start at its usual time, what will campus life and the student experience look like, and what will the family's financial uh, picture look like as we move forward. And so those are things that our campus is considering. Uh, Chancellor Blank had an opportunity to be on UW Now just a couple of weeks ago, 
And we really want to hit home that UW-Madison will take every consideration into making sure that we provide the best experience for our students, our faculty, and our staff. And we'll take into consideration, first and foremost, uh, the health and safety of our campus and, and community. And so in determining where we are, uh, I know that some, some people are uh, hearing things from other campuses about whether they'll be in person or virtual, we will make the best decision, I believe, as UW-Madison and how to, to best bring an experience, a UW experience to our students. So we're keeping that in mind. We're, we're keeping in mind our students' needs to grow and change in ways that we can't necessarily predict with a high level of accuracy because we haven't really experienced the COVID-19, although we've experienced other issues that might be economic, might be health, um, but a combination of the two really means that we have to be nimble and flexible. The ability to yield and retain our students, of course, is always a concern. We're really happy with our retention and graduation rates uh, on any given day, and we're really working hard with a team of faculty and staff across campus who are wrapping our arms around our students in a virtual way, a safe way, um, to, to make sure that they know that they are supported. And we, of course, Want, we're of course concerned like every other campus about how long the impact of COVID-19 will last. Will this last into the fall? Will it last until 2021? And what that will mean for our students and families. Uh, lastly, I'd like to say just thank you to all of you and the Badger family who supported us and supported our students. Well, thank you, Derek. Um, you know, what a great message. And uh, I'll tell you the thing I take away from all that, you're really right. It's at times like this that you really can forge a great bond with our future alumni when we come through that for them in the clutch like this in difficult times. So any any support we can gather for the Student Emergency Support Fund would be greatly appreciated. I know you guys are working really hard to allocate that in a effective and fair manner and uh, really appreciate all that you're doing. It's a lot of extra work, I realize, for your team and not something we ever thought we'd be dealing with. So, um, and not to mention, as you said, trying to deal with admitting a new class and you know how do we interact with people who are thinking about what's the fall going to be like i hear a lot of discussion about that you know i've seen a few uh university presidents mention that they think they're going to be open in the fall um kind of trying to put a stake in the ground maybe ahead of others and of course we're all aware students are making up their mind where they're going to go right now how does that affect student decisions do you think and um what's what's your take on that well, I think we won't know until the fall happens what the real impact will be. We're, we're really, we're monitoring, I can say, uh, if you could see some of us, we'd have 50 screens up monitoring what every institution is saying or doing at the same time. I would encourage students, families, and others to really read into statements that universities are making right now. I won't call out any particular institution. I will say that there's one very notable institution that says, uh, we will have it, we will, uh, be in, on campus in the fall. And if you read the line under that, but how that looks might be a little different. We might be virtual as well. <laughs> um, so really digging beneath uh, the headlines, Chancellor Blank is very clear on uh, what UW-Madison will consider. And that of course is the health and safety first. And I think that's a really critical part to how we approach this as a campus. We would never wanna bring our students uh, and, and families and others here uh, to really shuttle them back home quickly because we've made a decision that we thought would just uh, capture a class very quickly. Uh, so we, we do things diligently. We do things with um, considering all of the evidence we have and, and all of the other supplies and utilities and support that we have for our students. And we, we go for it just like Wisconsin always does in a way that's methodical, in a way that's sure and, and confident. Yeah, no, I think it's, uh, I, I really appreciate the chancellor's approach to, you know, waiting until we have to make a decision because obviously the information about the virus and the economy and all the other factors that play into this are changing by the day. And, you know, there's no point in making a decision too soon uh, only to put yourself in a corner. So uh, I really admire her willingness to take a thoughtful approach to that. Uh, got a question from the audience. Susan wonders, whether you would prefer to see a smaller fraction of our students working uh, as students. Uh, she notes that 80% to her strikes her as a pretty high number. Does that bother you at all? Not at all. It doesn't bother us uh, only because we can look at our graduation and our retention rates. Our students are graduating 
um, at, in 3.88 years, which is an amazing number, we have over a 90, uh, 95% retention rate. And so it doesn't bother us at all. Our students are not only graduating, but uh, other indicators like the indebtedness that they take on is incredibly low. Over half of our students never borrow for their education. Their grade point averages are high. Even those who borrow are returning uh, those, those investments are paying back those loans at a very high rate. Our default rate for student loans is 1.3%. Uh, it's among the lowest in the country. And so really, if we had some other indicators that would, that would tell us that maybe students are working too much, we would think about that again. But based on where we are, uh, we're, we're just really confident in our Badgers. Great. Question from Shannon. Uh, she wonders whether you've been consulting with peer institutions in how they're allocating some of this emergency student support funding and whether you share notes about that and what you might have learned from others or, or taught them. So the financial aid community is very small. We all know each other and we talk constantly all day, every day. And I can tell you the Big Ten is a really close group of uh, collaborators, especially when it comes to financial aid. So we do talk to them, but every campus has their own considerations and has to step through things um, in, in their own way, something that's you know best for them, uh, depending on their system, depending on a board of regents or a board of trustees. What I can say is that UW-Madison came out first among our peers with emergency assistance. And so some of the things that we've done have been modeled by other institutions and, and we're really happy to share in any way we can be helpful. How, how do you handle the volume of requests and how do you administer these grants quickly? Um, you know, it must be kind of overwhelming uh, when it hits so suddenly and something you're not really accustomed to doing. Yeah, I can tell you, it's just, a, it's an incredible team. I, I can't say enough about how many people step in and they look at the request. We had team members who literally spent all night long looking at student requests, looking at their files. And I can tell you every time they got a thank you and they got a lot of thank yous, uh, that really energized the team. So we have a, a huge chat feature um, that we use as a team and they go through that entire chat feature. And I can tell you just one of those thank yous sends a huge uh, spike in the number of people who will say, you know what, it's been a really long day, but I'm gonna go on and I'm gonna look at some more all the way through the night. And so uh, I attribute our very quick responses to, to students being very grateful and, and really pushing us through. So it, it's an incredible amount of the support. And I can't mention enough the support from our bursars team who are the people responsible for making sure that the, the funds actually get to the student. We, we make the award, but they make sure that it gets to the student. So it's an incredible team of people just really dedicated uh, to our Badgers. Great. Um, how long do you think these emergency needs will go on? Will they go on through the summer? Do we have students who will need funding in the summer and possibly in the fall? What, what do you expect? Absolutely. We're going to have students who have emergency needs through the summer. There are students who still can't return home for a number of, of reasons, like the students who we quoted before. Um, work has not returned to the level that our students are used to for their income. So we'll have those needs not only throughout the summer, but we'll have needs uh, throughout the fall for our students. And we'll try our best uh, with the support of, of the Badger family to, to meet those needs. And does the, the need for support, do you see any patterns there in-state versus out-of-state or graduate student versus undergraduate, anything jump out at you um, in, in that sense? Well, Mike, you know, we, we have that research team, so we study this. Uh, so we, we, have, we have so much data on, on you know, uh, the types of requests we get, but we've been uh, interested to see that the distribution is pretty even in terms of um, the students who are first generation or who are not first generation, for example, students who came in with a high level of need and students who did not, because this has impacted us. And one of the things that we've been very considerate of is that determining a student's need for this grant uh, using pre-COVID-19 uh, criteria in a current crisis really sh is not the best way to go. Uh, really, you have to assess each student's need on its merits and look at them on an individual basis. And we found that that's existed at the graduate professional level. Um, our graduate students um, on the whole have a lower need across the board, but when they do have a need, the dollar amount is typically a bit higher. So on average, for all the requests, we're looking at about $1,200. And if you think about that in the space of about um, two to three months, that's rent, food, supplies, perhaps travel uh, back home or, or helping someone else um, with, with ending the semester. 
that's typical. We might have a student like the one mentioned before who is a high risk pregnancy who might have a higher need because they're supporting a family. But the needs overall for our graduate professional students are just a bit lower in terms of the raw number than for our undergraduate students. And that's to be expected. Well, Derek, it looks like the audience is out of questions, but they're not out of praise for you. Uh, we're getting a lot of great oh. feedback. So, uh, and, and let me just amplify that and say, you know, I feel like we're really lucky that you chose Wisconsin. I know we chose you, but you chose us and you were fantastic in financial aid. As I noted, it's a pleasure working with you on a number of innovations that we did together and uh, just really delighted to see your career progress here up to enrollment management and uh, wish you more continued success and uh, let's keep doing great things here at Wisconsin. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. On Wisconsin, it's a great team. Well, thank you again to our audience as well. We appreciate you joining us tonight. We'll have a special segment on Thursday night, May 7th, where we'll talk about traditions old and new. Sarah Shute will uh, be joined by our own Jeff Wendorf as well. And uh, they'll be joined by an alum from the class of 1970 and a couple of soon to be alums from the class of 2020 to talk about traditions at Wisconsin. And the next Tuesday, May 12th, we'll shift our focus back to the economy will be joined by Noah Williams, who is the director of the Center for Research on the Wisconsin Economy. Noah is going to share a lot of interesting micro data on the impact of safer at home and uh, what they see uh, from the, the impact of the order and just people's behavior in the state, um, tracking cell phone data and other novel sources of information. And we'll also be joined by Brad Tank, chief investment officer from Neuberger Berman Funds in New York. They're a $300 billion asset manager. Uh, Brad is really a, a deep thinker about the macro economy and monetary policy and a graduate of our Applied Securities Analysis Program. So we'll have a, a Badger alum and one of our great faculty members next week talking about the economy. So I hope you'll join us then as well. Uh, and remember, Giving Tuesday now, uh, certainly appreciate any support you could lend to the UW Health COVID Response Fund, the COVID Research Fund, the Emergency Student Support Fund, and then the Chancellor's Annual Fund for areas of greatest need. Thanks for joining us and on Wisconsin.